Hi, my name is Dennis. Welcome to Foundations Linux Security Hardening. Let's look at the learning objectives. We're going to apply security permissions to sensitive areas and data. We want to make sure that we know what's needed and where and when. We also want to apply patch management and configuration strategies accordingly, and we'll learn about that upcoming in this lecture. We also want to familiarize with ourselves with frameworks and tools common to enterprise security requirements, all holistically help you with security hardening practices for your Linux operating system. Now, this is just a refresher on what it means to have uh, that, that endpoint again. So looking at since the file and directory, we have bin, Etsy, user, bar logs, right? All things that we need to make sure we have active permissions among. We're really looking at the crown jewels of our threat surface. We want to understand where attackers are going to hit first. Well, you might say, well, they could hit anywhere, Dennis. Well, they're probably not going to hit necessary cache or spool first. They may not hit temp. Depends on what they're looking for, and they may not hit mount or media. Really, these are things that are potentially temporary or things that are not useful for them for executing malicious code. What you really are interested in after is protecting the crown jewels, since the files potentially here. Configuration files, modifying library files that are commonly used by many applications, binaries of the operating system itself, the boot structure, and really also var logs, really. So if you look at uh, different items, including uh, var and log right here. What if I was able to make sure that no logs were found or that I edited logs to frame somebody else? The whole idea of security is protecting what makes sense to you from a practical standpoint of crown jewels. Where is the most valuable portion of your data, vulnerabilities to your system, and your overall threat surface? When you're thinking of securing systems, you have to look at AIC triad. Availability, integrity, and confidentiality. Let's look at more of that, what that means to us. Ultimately, over permissioning is a very dangerous factor. We've shown what happens with Etsy Shadow, and it has this, uh, the main use cases of hashes there. If you don't remember, we can certainly refresh on this. So each one of these is a user, and this is an Etsy Shadow example. When we look at each user, we also see a delineator of the type of encryption, aka hashing algorithm is used, such as uh, dollar sign six, and you'll look that up accordingly, dollar sign five, dollar sign one. And then ultimately between this one and the next, you can also look at uh, what's after that dollar sign six, which is paired up right here. Inside there, you also have what's the salt value. What is the actual salt that is ingested and combined with that hash to make what the ultimate hash looks like right here. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's a lot of work, and no, if a hash is one way and no one can actually do anything with it, why bother protecting it? Well, at the end of the day, you can actually reverse hashes, and many different programs exist, depending on your compute power and how long it takes. We have John the Ripper, all also mentioned as JTR in most uh, penetration testing circles. I happen to be a formal penetration tester. John the Ripper is still very much active, and we take shadow files, and Etsy files, and we call something called uh, Unshadow. Unshadow is a helper tool to John that merges the Etsy password file, which is all your group and metadata information, along with your Etsy shadow. Once those two are merged, you insert them into John the Ripper, and depending on your compute power and what kind of uh, word list you have and iterations and how weak your passwords are, it'll keep guessing matches based on your salt. It already knows your salt right here. It already knows your algorithms accordingly um, in the very front of your, uh, your structure. So all it needs to do is continue the loop until it finds an exact match. Not exactly the best case uh, of security there. One thing to really note is that who's gonna have the permissions to shadow in this case? Think about it. So looking up here in your permissions list, pause the video and think about what is actually needed. Who needs access to shadow and when? What services need access to shadow? And when do we need to use Shadow or anything other than those two use cases? Think about it. OK, so now that you've had some time to think about it, what do we need to use for Shadow? What kind of Chmod permissions do we, permissions do we need? Does root need to have always access to it? Well, the root 
service count, maybe, yeah. Do all administrators qualify to, to be able to access it? Maybe, depends, right? Not all admins need that. So what I would think is only root and other group services, such as the um, shadow service group might need access to that uh, for login information. So there's a shadow group that other services use for authentication. That needs it, but you don't need to have every admin group needing it. So just if I'm Dennis Chow and I run admin, I have other admins with me. Should we know each other's passwords to be able to crack them? Well, certainly not. You also want to make sure that Ubuntu, or any other Linux distribution that you're using, uses a group shadow um, that is separate from your admin uh, typical group for administration. Root should be the owner, shadow should be the group. That's your permission set. And really, you want to you make sure that it has minimal permission set. It's not a piece of binary. So really, you just need read and write and read and write, depending on what is required. Everyone else should not have any access, which is you know, 0, 0, 0, essentially. So what does that mean? Well, let's take a look at it. So that's a 4 plus 2. That's a 6 and a 6 and a 0. And we can verify that um, elsewhere. Shadow may only need read access, so that could actually be a six and a um, and a and a four, depending on your system type and your use cases required. Okay, let's move onward. Now it's your turn to think about what you can do wrong. Last time when we were playing with commands and administration, we were registering a service with NCAP. This is an example service of uh, a template of syslog itself. Where can I go wrong? If I were to provide an accidental 752 to this file, what can happen with it? Pause the video and think about it, then come back. OK, so what does the two mean? Let's go back to what your Chimano uh, authors look like. There's a write for a number two, and a read for a four, and an execution of one. All right, let's go back to what we need to do. We have a write. So we have uh, owner slash user, we have group, and when we have other. The two it may, uh, provides me a write, unfortunately. We'll start backwards. We have a group of what? Well, we have execute and read. So we have read and X, and then we have read, write, for X because of seven. Well, if anyone, can write to this file, what would you think we would have had the most trouble by? Look for different areas. Pause the video and think about this some more. Okay, so knowing that we have write permission for almost anyone, where would I start first as an attacker? Well, we can modify the template in many different ways, but one of the most important ones is the execution start parameter area. Maybe I might modify it to run my execution code. And remember that the last time we saw the service runtime with system control, it ran as root by default. Pretty scary, right? It also has socket information and other details by default. And as long as I don't have an error condition, that service will stay running, terminate state resistant, and automatically try to restart itself as someone wants to turn it off. Pretty scary, right? So remember, permissions matter. Permissions matter. So upon reboot or any kind of daemon reload, we might have that issue if I inject it, perhaps my NCAT script here, as you saw from the last lecture. Now in tandem with permissioning, we also have to think about confidentiality, right? We also have not just integrity and availability, what confidentiality means, do I need to have that person see what I know? And to do this, we have a combination of different factors, not just access control, but also encryption. Encryption is incredibly important. In your browser, you might use TLS. And say we have a padlock secured website. Sometimes people call it HTTPS uh, and mistakenly use SSL as the older standard, which is perfectly fine. That should be an S, there we go, SSL. And that's making sure you have a secure website. Basically, anything that you read on the internet is not being able to be sniffed by anyone else outside of your connection between the server and yourself. Well, that's a lot to do. So we have symmetric encryption that basically says, hey, I know a secret, and maybe you know a secret. 
If Dennis shares a secret with you as a student and we didn't tell anyone else, such as other instructors, and we had our own encryption algorithm of discussion, that would be symmetric encryption there because we use the same key, the same secret to encrypt data and decrypt data. Hence, one key, symmetric encryption. I have an original plain text of my message sending to you as a student. You, we shared secrets somehow. Maybe we both have a secret of someone else's birthday plus some, some age or something of that nature. We have a special code, an algorithm to encrypt that and then decrypt it with a function. So we have an encryption function and we have an inverse of that, which is your decryption function um, accordingly. And I can give you an encrypted text file and if someone else with a snippet, such as an other instructor, they wouldn't be able to get to it, at least in a timely manner. Encryption symmetric algorithms include RC4, AES, PGP, which means pretty good protection, and among others. Most of these you'll see in full disk encryption and anything that requires performance-based encryption requirements and standards. Now, asymmetric encryption involves two keys per entity. So Bob and Alice might have, uh, we'll have a total of four keys. We'll have a public and we'll have a private for each person. A public and a private for each person. Now, as you can imagine, private stays with that person. A public is for someone to exchange it with. So think of a public key as your relational key to your private key and you exchange it with another person. Thanks to asymmetric encryption um, by the geniuses at RSA as well as the ECC style uh, asymmetric encryption, you can exchange the public keys in the clear in front of everybody and they wouldn't be able to divide your private key in any reasonable fashion. You'll go ahead and use your uh, clear text message and you'll encrypt it using your de destination party's encrypted public, uh, so you encrypt it using the public key of the destination party. So if Bob wants to send a message to Alice, they exchange their public keys out in the open, which it doesn't matter even if attacker snipped it. And then Bob will use Alice's public key as long as it's verified to encrypt the data and send that encrypted data to her via email or whatever it may be. Alice will then use her private key to decrypt that message and then we'll do the same thing vice versa. Now that's a lot more complications, and a lot more work and so that your performance also suffers with that. Keep that in mind as you're developing solutions, what's your required encryption level and can symmetric key suffice? Now, in addition to symmetric and asymmetric encryption, we also have patch management. You've seen in Windows updates that ask you to reboot all the time, or even a Mac OS X update. Ubuntu does the same thing. In fact, many Debian distributions have uh, different update packages available to them. By default, we have unintended uh, upgrades installed inside Ubuntu, and that's the a command line addition with a front end GUI. The command line addition has the ability to automatically update in a configuration file that you can actually change, which is right here listed if you wanted to mess with that. We also have security updates. We can download uh, them automatically. So Ubuntu, if you click, uh, search for software and updates, click on updates and see where uh, you're configured. This should match this. So basically that's a front end to the unintended upgrades paths, but that's great for one system, but really how do you scale that? Um, so you really have to think about what kind of tools and mechanisms you're using and what you need to really utilize for the near future um, as you scale and grow. Maybe you have not just one Ubuntu machine, maybe you have 5,000 in another year. Who knows? So make sure that whatever you select for your enterprise and whatever you engineer against is based on scalability and viability for the near future. Next, we have security configurations. What state should you be at? What level of security do you need to be at? Do I need to have a firewall? Do I need to have an antivirus? And the answer is both yes, right? Just like any other operating system, malware comes in all different forms. And in fact, based on the way Linux is architected versus Windows, it's easier to write malware for syscalls and Linux kernels than it is for Windows. What you can use is a series of baselines and tools. And there's other benchmarks, such as CIS benchmarks for Linux or the enterprise uh, NIST CSF for federal systems. So CSF being cybersecurity framework, and you can utilize these to help you determine what is best for my organization. Ask your information security team if you're not part of that team already. You can utilize different tools that have these baselines built in. Once it shows uh, Linus, and you'll see that in your labs upcoming in our demonstration as well, to really understand where your system's at from a 
uh, security configuration standpoint and where you need to be at, depending on what you're looking for in your baseline assessment. We talked about scalability, about how to update things, how to make sure your configuration is baseline. Well, there's policy as code, software, and client server installations that go with it. And really tools such as Chef, Puppet, and Ansible, and there are many others. So if we're in the Microsoft world, you'll use Microsoft System Center, which is SCCM. In Linux world, we use a lot of Chef, Puppet, again, and Ansible, and many other aspects. If you're in Amazon Web Services, for instance, you might use Systems Manager, otherwise known as SSM. Ultimately, these are all things as considered policy as code, and they want to keep a desired state. So they'll help you maintain compliance by installing uh, agents on different computers, such as your Ubuntu VMs. And the master server will have a policy that says, hey, make sure these changes are deployed in a certain way, and make sure you check them, check against them at certain intervals to make sure that the computers are compliant to a certain patch level, a configuration need, and make sure they have things like firewall and antivirus enabled. Now we look at system risk and hardening and how risk relates to anything else. Risk is a measurement against threat times vulnerability. What is a threat? Well, a threat is the actor. What could be a threat? Well, in the real world, a threat is maybe a hurricane. And the vulnerability might be your house is not hurricane resistant. That's a higher level risk. Now you also have to look at probability and other factors as well, but at the most basic sense, risk is threat times the vulnerability. Now let's look a little bit deeper and you should know that your system has an accessibility attack service. Are you out on the web? Do you have ports open to the internet other than your local network? If so, you have a higher attack service because attackers can get to you remotely from anywhere in the internet. If you don't have that, or if you've locked it down and it's isolated uh, your network so that only physical access is required, you reduce your attack service by quite a bit, but now you have insider threats still. Then you have probability involved, which is the threat capability. What are the tools, publicly known exploits, how old are the exploits, um, and other techniques that the uh, advanced persistent threat, which is APT, may have in for you. So nation states, uh, high skilled hackers might have higher levels so higher levels of threat capability, therefore higher chances of probability of success. And finally, you have your total vulnerabilities of your system. Your assessment tools might help you with that over the network with sockets and ports open or the configurations with Linus to configure, uh, figure out your configuration issues for audits and other issues around your hardening of your baseline. Remember, a lot of it depends on the Venn diagram circles that you see here. And there's no one way to have perfect security. You're not going to have it. All you can do is reduce the risk, ultimately, even though, because there's no such thing as removing the threat. If you removed one or the other completely, you wouldn't have risk to begin with. As you're deploying these changes, including security updates, configuration patching, regardless of the tool you're using, there's multiple deployment strategies to help you with this. In place includes all at once and rolling. So in place basically means you have a limited structure infrastructure set, limited set of systems, and you can do a very small amount, such as one at a time, or even maybe a quarter at a time. It doesn't matter. These are all sort of rolling updates. Uh, you might select a series of sample users like other IT individuals or other DevOps or security individuals that have a lot more technical expertise to roll back or troubleshoot when there's a problem when you update systems. So alternatively, the fastest approach, which is fastest and cheapest, which is all at once, but you pose the risk of having to roll back everything. And remember, not all rollbacks help. So for instance, an example, if you updated your phone, for instance, and let's say something happened to that phone and you couldn't get things to work, you try to roll back to a previous iOS version or an Android version, and what happened? Not everything was back to hunky door normal. Something was left in there and the changes did not roll back all the way to its original state. That's a risk that you have to take when you have to use all at once uh, deployment strategies, although the cheapest and sometimes the fastest, uh, you should only reserve that for emergencies, such as security incidents or other emergencies that require an emergency change control. Try to use in, uh, rolling inbound whenever possible, regardless of how much your percentage you use with that. Most enterprises on premise today without a cloud presence must utilize that methodology uh, for, for general agility as well as safety.
There's another deployment strategy called blue green. Blue green just means you're duplicating your infrastructure environment. So let's say you have version one of your software. You need to create the exact duplicate of a, uh, another production ready level version two of your software and stand it up accordingly. And then afterwards, you still have both of them together and then you'll swap everyone over at one time to version two. If there's a problem, you can always swap back until your version two has been debugged. After your version two has been vetted and everyone's at 100% utilization on the new version, you're gonna go ahead and decommission this. And that way you can um, go back to a, a new pro production environment. Now, this is not very practical for enterprise environments that don't have a cloud presence. Are you really going to have the customer or your internal uh, competitors or your IT personnel spend the money to stand up an exact duplicate of your environment for every single change? And the answer I bet is really no. So the only way to get this done in a scalable and cost efficient fashion is really you, you have to rely on cloud somehow. Someone else doing the work for you, easily spinning it up, easily spinning it down, and only paying for what you use at the time that you use it. Not spending days, weeks, or months procuring software and hardware, and then deploying it only to destroy it later. That doesn't make a lot of sense for on-premise. And so far, that's really the deployment strategy for most cloud or hybrid provider uh, organizations. Now, a modification to that blue-green concept is called the canary. The canary is the difference of not just cutting over at one point and then rolling back if you had to when there's problems, you're slowly providing A-B testing if, if that. So you might have a selected set of users and some users here um, being slowly moved to code version two in your green environment. After an incremental, again, again incrementals, so you're incrementing it based on your trust of the version two of your code or your change, then you can finally move everyone over and then decommission the blue environment, which is your old environment altogether. This is the slowest and safest and also the most costly way of deploying changes as well as your application versioning. So that was a lot to take in. Let's take a short break and do some quick demos of what we've been talking about so far. We'll see you then. Hi, and welcome back from your break. I hope it went well. Let's dig down Make sure your uh, terminals are up on your screen and follow along if you can. This may help you in your labs. So first and foremost, let's do an app update and apt upgrade. Sudo, make sure, make sure you add sudo in between. Now, what does it mean when I'm doing this? What does the double ampersand mean? Pause the video, make sure you have your answer and return back. Okay, so the double ampersand means if I have a return zero of exit nicely, exit gracefully, and add a command one, then proceed the command two, chain the events. Make sure that there is no error in the front so I can run the upgrade accordingly. And what this means is that I'm gonna go ahead and upgrade all my packages to the latest possible edition supported by uh, stable releases inside my app updates here. While that's going on, we're also going to evaluate a couple of other things. Open up a new tab, and we're also going to evaluate, uh, evaluate the file, uh, vim etsy apt, app.conf.d, and then we're also going to have the uh, 50 un unattended upgrades. And this is part of the unattended upgrades package, which was highlighted in the uh, deck earlier. By default, Ubuntu already has this. And so these comments are already taken out for uh, security, patches, and other related high visibility items that allow automatic updates without any kind of uh, alleviation and um, issues around your, your distro. So you can always edit those and make sure you read through them as you necessary, but we really don't need to worry too much about that. And in fact, uh, we can PSES grep unattended and see if that is actually running. And it indeed is, and is actually a Python -it programming. Very cool. We have zero to upgrade, which is awesome. And in fact, if you go into uh, searching through here, so let's go and search for uh, updates. You can also go through software updates right here. You can also do the uh, text-based searching whenever you need. And the software update looks like that and it'll eventually open up a window, but you can also look at software updates up here to 
check in with your from your GUI perspective. So while it's doing that, it's going to go ahead and index everything. And we should pop up with our updates, especially right here, telling us the same thing that we're going to automatically install security updates on Mac. We can also uh, play with these other settings, completely up to you, but these will also update the, the configuration file that we looked at earlier. Uh, now, Ubuntu and the later editions have a live patching. I'm not going to set that up uh, because that could have an impact on our future coding or reboot requirement work later on. So I wanted to provide you that, that uh, requirement in baselining here. Now, for your labs, you might want to use uh, different items. I would suggest looking up the CIS benchmarks and really determining what kind of Linux requirements there are um, so to make your stuff hard. Imagine if you were a healthcare system. What kind of compliance frameworks and regulations might you might need to think about? Pause the video, think about it, do some searches, and come back. Okay, so you should have found out that there might have been HIPAA security rule and HIPAA privacy rule. There's High Tech Act, and then really there's another trusted entity called a High Trust that provides attestation that you could be uh, at a certain baseline for a HIPAA compliance. Ultimately, it's about HIPAA and high trust. You can look for baselines that are related to those, or you can choose to elect something else. More than likely for a healthcare entity, you need HIPAA. And depending if you are a public institution or a federal institution, you might also need NIST baseline, and your security team would have to consolidate the baselines and provide you as a developer, systems administrator, or an analyst what to do with that. So we can baseline ourselves using some basic tool sets. Assuming we install Linux, you can do a quick audit system with the tat tat click, and it's going to run for a little bit. And you can also look up some additional information and do the package upgrade on it. Mine is a little bit older, so it's more than four months old. I suggest you update to the latest edition possible. Use your knowledge from your app Git repositories to upgrade this. As that's going through, it'll provide us a series of recommendations, and we're going to have those recommendations put into a form of policy as code, utilizing things like Chef or Puppet. We're not going to set that up because you only have one uh, system here, and we have no other resources at present right now for additional um, line items here. So you can also run all of that accordingly to what you're looking for. In addition, we want to talk about more, not just about patching and assessment, and we want to make sure that we have changes. Again, this will run for a little bit. You can keep running it as necessary. Looking at things like slash Etsy password versus slash Etsy pa uh, shadow, you can really evaluate your permission settings that you need accordingly. And we'll look at var log, maybe var log auth, right? Auth not log. And really, we have some really good security practices already built in. We only have the owner, which is either the syslog, which created the syslog to begin with, and the admin group allowing for a read access only. Same with shadow and same with uh, uh, for root for that. And of course, for even password, read write access to only the user root. These are already secured, but have we had any other letters in the uh, next two groups? Think about what things you could do and what, what could be done with that kind of threat. And what kind of permissions would you do? And what kind of commands would you run to change those? Think about it and get back to us after the pause. Pause the video right now. Think about it, write it down, and come back. OK, hopefully you wrote down something that had a 0 among the last grouping here where your Chamod Octal. That's great. Now, let's think about encryption. Now, encryption can mean many different things to a lot of people. Really, encryption is a form of encoding, but you're encoding it with a secret key. Different encodings mean different things, so you can also say echo something to encode, and you can say base64, and that is a base64 encoding, but it's completely reversible. I'm going to say the same thing about MD5sum or SHA-1, and all these, these are hashes, and they're not supposed to be reversible. You can certainly guess them with enough effort and computational horsepower. What you really need is a secret encryption, keys, things that are uh, known and set to be very hard to break unless you knew the exact key. So let's use an unencrypted standpoint. Make sure you have the 7-zip package installed. 
I already do. You can look it up in your lab if you need help. All right, so let's create my unencrypted. You know, let's make sure we're in our desktop print working directory. All right, um, and let's go ahead and say my unencrypted data. We'll move this to unencrypted.txt. And I'm missing a, a double quote. And there we go. So I can cat it, completely unencrypted. And I'm not sure why I can't get it. Yeah, unencrypted. Interesting. That is interesting. My unencrypted.txt. Um, oh, I misspelled it. Well, move unencrypted to unencrypted. I was wondering why would that happen. So that's been updated accordingly. Cat it. Done. All right. So we can use different tools. So one tool for encrypting at the file object level, which is good for attachments or uploading different files, not necessarily net emails or anything large. We can use 7-zip. Right? It's one of the 7-zip package using your man page. Understand that you can add something to the archive. Turn on encryption, which is MHE equals on. You can say my secret, so I can say my secret, and that's actually still really weak, but that's just a password to have for the sake of the um, argument here. We're going to say utilize the encrypted that 7z as our file to um, password protect everything in, and we're going to encrypt and zip um, using this standard unencrypted.txt. Awesome. Now, if we did a cat on Encrypted.zip. We have just a bunch of binary and it doesn't help us at all with anything. When we look at the entropy of unencrypted.zip uh, text, we say we have a low in in entropy rating of 3.6, right? Human, human low. So if we do an entropy rating of encrypted, we have a 6.75. So we've doubled our random, our entropy here. So very good. And of course, to decrypt it, we have the same key. So just like we ran um, my secret as the key itself, we need to unencrypt it. So to unencrypt it, we just simply extract it. We use a different um, setup. So I'm going to use echo here so I can remind myself what I used for my key. Just to stand it out, nothing else. Seven zip, extract. Uh, let's remove our unencrypted.txt first um, in case it doesn't want to clobber it. And then we're going to go ahead and extract um, our, our line item here. Seven zip extract with our uh, command the encrypted zip file to uh, and to uh, to the same directory. Uh, and we're using my secret. And bam, we're back to normal. Nothing has changed at all uh, for that. So that's an example of symmetric encryption. Um, in the most basic sense. So we're going to remove the encrypted that seven zip. Now we can utilize different items um, such as checking the uh, pluggable authentication manager. So you notice that when I created a user last time, I'm not sure if I remember deleting it. I think I did. But we created a user last time, we were able to use tests and tests as the password. Not exactly very secure. So one of the things that we want to make sure we do is make sure the PAM service, which is global authentication module for Linux, is actually running. Type service, type equal service. And we want to grep for um, case instead of PAM. And it's actually um, not really running. That's OK. So it's not even registered as a service. So let's see if we actually can find it running inside PS. Oopsie, and I'll use PS. And look, Pam is indeed running as a session worker in the background, um, ironically running with my credentials. So let's look for all these different things inside the scpam.d um, directory. Double tab, and wow, we have a lot of different password related files. And so we can look at um, one in particular that we're looking for. We'll clear that out. And then we're going to grab 
uh, for a very common minimum length requirement inside um, inside that file. So Etsy Pam the common password. Nope. And we also have, let's see if we have Pam um, TW. Nope. Also in there. Let's take a look directly inside here. Okay, so we have what's called the password requirement. So success, failure, and ignore. And by default, it's saying we need a certain set of complexity or obscurity. So basically it's saying, make sure you have um, a certain amount of uh, hashing and salting. So you can actually look up more information in these comments here. I would do so. We can also add a minimum length uh, parameter here. So to add it, it's minimum length equal like five or something like that. And you can actually save it reboot and then go ahead and try to create a new user that has a password less than five characters long and see what happens. So this is another way you can do security uh, appropriately for that. And of course we have finished our hardening request and we have all kinds of stuff here which are uh, will help us do so. You can always click the link and see um, audit D is enabled which we did last a uh, couple of modules back. And you can actually open that up in a browser and see how you can fix it based on the remediation requirements accordingly. I'll let you do that in the lab. Now, one thing I also want to showcase was the idea of SUID binaries. So I wanted to showcase this, and even though this is not going to work on um, your version of Ubuntu uh, coming through, I'll let you discover it. Um, I really wanted to showcase the capabilities of the dangers of SUID um, and to begin with. So SUID executables basically mean that you add a plus S accordingly. And visiting this website here, we can show you that these are older versions and older distributions are sustainable or susceptible to SUID violations. And so SUID means that you are using a binary and it's gonna run as um, root regardless of who runs it. And so this was made primarily for legacy applications and binaries. And so you can find uh, these, these unfortunate permissions right here using either this or this um, and looking for um, offending files inside your directory. And these are the uh, interactive applications such as MMAP and VIM that can call a bash shell from within uh, if they were unfortunately uh, permission with SUID. So what does SUID permission look like? Well, you'll see S is right here um, in the actual browser here. So if I scroll here, you'll see the S right here at the left side of this accordingly. And so you'll see this big red sign here. And unfortunately, um, we can't get the older versions of MMAP on your system, uh, but you can certainly see how this might affect and get instant root access with the SUID um, permissions here. Now, the other reason why it won't work other than versioning is that if you clicked on, uh, if you typed in the word mount, and we can do a grep, or no suit. You can see that really all of our mounted file systems that we're running on says no suit. So even if you accidentally turned on suit, which I will do here for demonstration purposes only, um, let's say Vim was still um, susceptible for whatever reason on MMAP. Let's say we still had the MMAP version that was still susceptible. Mine is not. Uh, this goes all the way to 5.2 as far as a susceptible version that had the interactive switches, which um, you would know if you had this. Uh, and there's no interactive switch, unfortunately. If you have that switch, you can actually um, do the SUID um, exploit here. So uh, which nmap, we'll start with that. It's user, it's slash user slash bin. We'll do is um, an ls lah on uh, nmap on that particular absolute path. And so we see that there's no suit, which is good. You see a green there. And now we're going to ruin our day and say sudo chmod um, u plus s, which provides that suit access to slash bin slash mmap. And unfortunately, when we do that again, we're going to have a big red sign saying, no, we should not do that. This is going to run as a root um, by anyone that can have access to run it, which is the x that you see here. Even if we ran it with that uh, version that we were looking for, it won't run properly because 
we have a couple of things going for us. We have a later version of an MAP, which in our case is um, 7.8. And another case is that all of our file systems slash user, for instance, uh, everyone is running no suit inside our default installation. And so even if we had different layers of security fail, this would be the ultimate stopper of it. So you really want to layer all your security hardening in layers, not relying on one or the other. So remember that in terms of compensating controls. And while this suit will never work inside Ubuntu at the current configuration, it's really good to know what your threat surface looks like and how to avoid them accordingly. That's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Good luck in your labs. We'll see you next time.